with that, I'm now going to hand over to Costas and uh, look forward to, to hearing his insights. And in about half an hour's time, we'll open up to breakout groups. Thank you. Okay, thank you, um, Jonathan. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to, to be here with you. I responded to the uh, invite um, very willingly. Um, I want to explore some ideas with people who are socialists and who think uh, radically about capitalism and see where we are and where we might go in the near future. What are the uh, implications of the coronavirus crisis? Now, I've got to tell you that this is very much work in progress because obviously the crisis has just started. Uh, it's work that we've been developing um, through an international um, team of uh, socialists and um, researchers uh, in the UK, but also in Spain, in um, Italy, in France, and elsewhere. Hopefully, we will produce um, some, uh, um, some important, powerful work uh, uh, in the time to come, discussing where capitalism is going, basically. So let me give you an insight. Let me give you a taste of, um, uh, of our thinking and uh, of our work. But before I do that, can you all hear me okay? Are we all right? Yeah, good. Um, okay, now the coronavirus crisis, right? This is of course um, unprecedented. There's been, there's, there's been no crisis like that in the history of capitalism. It's unprecedented for a variety of reasons, some of which are obvious. And the most important one is of course the role of the state in uh, inducing the crisis or accelerating it and in dealing with it. And that's what makes it so important. Um, I want to discuss the implications for economy, for society and for politics at this stage uh, of, of, of our knowledge, because obviously things are going to unfold. Uh, after making a case, I will exemplify it briefly for the European Union. I will tell you what I think the impact will be uh, on the European Union and what it tells us about the European Union. I was saying then that we must start with the economy, because in the first instance, this is an economic shock of the first order. But it was delivered to a weakening economy because the neoliberal financialized capitalism of our times, certainly in the mature core countries of the system, had reached a plateau after the crisis of 2007, 2009, and it wasn't really uh, advancing in any dynamic uh, uh, way at all. And you can see this very easily in terms of four, um, key figures, four key uh, points. The first is that growth, in other words, capital accumulation, because that's basically what growth is, has been very weak during this last decade, the weakest it's been for, for years, since, since the 1970s. So growth has been very weak. Capital accumulation has been very weak. Second, profitability of capital, particularly uh, productive capital, um, has been weak has been weak and actually declining since about 2014, 2015. So no great shakes for profitability. Third, a crucial productivity growth, the engine of capitalism. Capitalism must have rapid productivity growth, must change, revolutionize the means of production, as Marx said, right? Must change uh, productivity, improve productivity all the time if it is to succeed. Productivity growth has been appalling um, across the core countries, and in Britain, it has been atrocious, the worst uh, for decades. Um, and last, fourth point, inequality, which is basically a sickness that eats capitalism from within. Inequality has reached unprecedented levels, um, and it has become worse um, the last decade. So on all these scores, this was weak accumulation um, without, dynamic uh, strength to it and actually uh, promoting uh, inequality uh, in society, therefore creating tensions. In a sense, what happened since 2007, 2009, since that huge crisis, is that no structural change has taken place. Everybody talked about it. The ruling class across the world, the ruling classes across the world talked about it, but in practice, no structural change of any substance 
basically um, they used control over money and they used control over key central banks to stabilize the system to, uh, to avoid the collapse in 2009 but did not change things you could see that in terms of um, finance as well um, that's the last point I want to make on the economy in terms of finance because people keep talking and keep thinking that because we live in an era of financialization finance has been going from strength to strength oh no that's not the case um, finance in the core countries the the, the metropolitan countries uh, of capitalism the United States Britain and so on finance the sector of finance has been at best marking time since 2000 uh, and nine um, and you can see that in terms of debt um, financialized capitalism is capitalism of debt and yet the last 10 years the balance of debt is being uh, unusual household debt has declined because people don't borrow for, for housing mortgage debt has declined um, bank to bank debt has declined but bank to enterprise debt or market to enterprise debt has increased and crucially state debt has increased this has become capitalism relying on the state borrowing money to sustain the financial system and to keep the structural parameters broadly the same that's the last 10 years that um, um, we have lived through it is financial financialized capitalism relying on the state it's extraordinary and the, the most important its ability to create money through the central bank, pump money into the system, and keep prevent the, the thing from collapsing. So that for the state, that that, that much for the state of uh, uh, of the key countries in two thousand um, since two thousand and nine. Now look, now let look at the shock. Now look at coronavirus. Now coronavirus is a, is in the first instance. Uh, a public health issue first and foremost right it's a public health issue um, and the first thing it revealed is that this financialized capitalism lacking dynamism unequal and so on is certainly incapable of dealing with health shocks there is no doubt at all about it um, health services uh, proved um, uh, not up to the task provision was weak uh, awareness and ability to, um, to, to to defend the health of the public uh, was very poor. Um, neoliberal policies followed for decades um, have weakened, significantly weakened uh, health. That's, that's clear. That's clear. Let's, I don't, don't want to spend too much time on that. We can discuss it later. When you look at the shock to the economy, however, things become far worse than this. Far worse than this. Why? Because of course, to deal with the epidemic, this a state that was incapable of handling it in any rational way, shut the economy down. That's basically what they did. They were unprepared and incapable of dealing with the epidemic uh, in a selected way, in a selective way, targeted way, and so on, and they shut the economy down. Um, shutting the economy down delivered a shock of unprecedented magnitude. Um, on the side of demand, aggregate demand, what we had was phenomenal contraction demand collapsed basically and it, it it collapsed because people stayed at home they rearranged what they spend and certain areas of the economy were devastated eating out hotels traveling and so on other areas had uh, a, a weakening of demand and therefore um, employment immediately suffered because people were fired or or, or, or put on notice at the same time, there was a shock to supply. The shock to supply was even more severe than the shock, to, the shock to demand because obviously, if you shut down some firms, then you stop the supply chain and therefore you stop production in other firms and you do it across borders. So the shock to supply was also tremendous and therefore loss of employment from the, the, the shock to supply. The combined thing, the impact on working people, losing um, employment, and weakening of income has delivered a dramatic shock, uh, secondary, secondary shock to, to demand, and therefore we're heading towards an unprecedented recession. I mean, the magnitude of the recession by all 
accounts will be unprecedented uh, for decades in uh, the core countries. We don't know exactly how big it's, it's going to be. Like organizations in the world, right? The IMF came out with uh, an assessment uh, three days ago that is, um, you know, just eye-watering. I mean, uh, they're talking of seven and a half percent recession, contraction um, across the European Union. So uh, it's huge, right? Now, two more points on this. The shock to the core of the system then is gigantic. An already weakening economy has received that shock, and therefore you're talking of a huge recession. The shock to the periphery uh, might be even bigger. And it might be even bigger because the periphery will be hit by the recession of the core, the contraction of trade, um, and crucially, the, um, the retreat of capital, the, the reversal of capital flows. Uh, people, uh, lenders, big money capitalists will be pulling their money out of uh, um, the developing countries and that will uh, create, has cre already created financial difficulties, add the impact on trade, you're gonna have balance of trade difficulties, currencies are falling. The situation across the developing world looks simply appalling if you add the impact of the uh, epidemic as well to it. So. It's a global shock, it's a global crisis, an unprecedented crisis in the history of capitalism, I repeat. The last thing to say, the second and last thing to say in this, is that amidst all this chaos, we also had an oil shock. The coronavirus did not cause the oil shock. Um, that had to do with global oil politics, um, but it has materialized. So, basically a war of producers, a war of producers for control of um, output, big producers, state producers, but also private producers. Um, the war of producers has uh, created a flood of supply. And at the same time, demand collapsed because of the recession. The combination has been deadly for oil. And some oil in the United States, I don't know if you've been following it, some oil in the United States has actually dropped below zero in terms of price. In other words, producers are paying consumers to take the oil away because it, it, it is cheaper to do that rather than store the oil. The collapse in the oil price means, of course, that for some developing countries, the crisis is now a matter of life or death. Venezuela, uh, other, other uh, small, sizable producers of, with low incomes, but also big producers like uh, Saudi Arabia. Others though will benefit because the, the falling oil price will lessen the pressure on the balance of trade. So it's complex. So that much about the economy. Now, immediately that shock became clear and the, the magnitude of the crisis became clear. It became evident that something had to be done. Here, I'll have to tread on sort of difficult terrain because it's not in entirely clear what, what will happen, what policy will be on the part of uh, the ruling elite. It's not entirely clear. And we will be skating between what, what they are doing and what they ought to be doing, or what I think they ought to be doing, and what we should be arguing that they, they should be doing. It's, it's clear, however, that whatever the, 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 the response to the crisis is, it will hinge in the first instance on the nation state. The nation state is the main uh, um, agent for confronting it, but it cannot be just the nation state. It cannot be that just that, it must also be society itself, it must also be communities, it must also be associational networks, it must also be grassroots organizations, because if it is just the state, then the state will probably defend neoliberalism again. Then the state will probably confront the crisis in ways that will entrench neoliberal privilege and will not really bring about um, uh, structural transformation. Um, so let me, oh, uh, before, I, uh, one last thing here. In other words, it's a matter fundamentally of democratic intervention as well. If it is the state that has to respond and if it is local communities that have to respond, it's a matter of democratic intervention. It's a matter of actually democratizing the response. And I think that's where the left should also intervene. Now, 
in its broad parameters, the response is clear. It's not really, it's not really rocket science, right? If demand has collapsed, which it has, then we need societal, in other words, state mechanisms for boosting demand, which means protect employment, prevent people from being fired, and protect income. In other words, pay people's um, uh, income publicly and see what you will do later. This, this is the obvious, the, min, the, 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 the very minimum that needs to be done. And therefore, in this context, now is the moment for us, I think, to argue in a coherent way for a basic income. Uh, the strategy of basic income is in effect put in place, it has been put in place by, by, by many states across the world. Now is the time to argue it seriously and we can discuss it subsequently, uh, what it might mean. So that's the first part, support demand uh, in that way. Second and equally crucial is of course, intervene on the supply side. Intervening on the supply side has a different set of uh, determinants, of course. What uh, the state and society must do is intervene to prevent the collapse of the supply chains. And that means taking certain areas of the economy under public management and under public ownership, because that's basically what it boils down to. Okay? Take certain areas under public management and public ownership. Uh, use state aid um, creatively and uh, in effective ways uh, locally. Um, and have a big program of public investment through which to boost supply and to boost production um, locally. In a sense, what, what needs to be done, and that can start um, in the fairly near future, is a program that would be centrally led that would rebalance the economy. And it would rebalance the economy in this country and elsewhere uh, in Europe, but also in the United States. Um, and uh, across much of the world. The question that immediate, immediately arises is how to fund it, how to pay for that. Okay, I don't think that I don't think that any sane person would actually disagree with the main parameters that we might disagree on how it's going to be done. What does it mean to boost demand? What does it mean to, to boost supply? What does it mean to intervene? And how do you do it? But that they need boosting is clear. The question is how to pay for it. And there we come to the cracks of it, because obviously it's impossible to pay for it unless the state borrows. They left to be public borrowing. It's, 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 it's plain arithmetic. They left to be um, public borrowing. And that means, in effect, that uh, the state will, will have to operate uh, as if this was a, a war situation. We need war finance. People keep talking about uh, a war situation, a war, war conditions, okay? Actually, it's not really war conditions in terms of the reality of it, because in a war, you shift productive capacity away from peace towards war activities, and you cut people's consumption in order to do that. That's not where we are. We're in a crisis. However, funding the way out of the crisis needs war finance. In other words, it needs the state to come in, the state must borrow, it must use the banking system. It must uh, expand uh, its ability to obtain funds across society. And it must use that in order to rescue the economy. In effect, the state will be making a down payment on future production, which must be reorganized, as I said, on a social uh, basis. And that must also happen with the active participation of local communities. Now, I've already spoken for quite a long time. I've got another 10 minutes, haven't I? Jonathan. I've got another 10 minutes, no? Yes, you have another 10 minutes, so I, I was on mute there, so yes. So let me, let me, let me, I mean, I've been going through it very rapidly, so I hope I haven't, um, you know, I've done it too fast. But we'll find, we'll find, we'll find out when it comes to questions. Um, let me say now, let me exemplify this with regard to the EU. This is a general case that I have made to you about uh, the core of the system. The European Union is a very peculiar part of the core of the system, however. And uh, 
it allows us to bring out some of the social and political dimensions of this uh, broad case uh, in a very particular and very sharp way. Uh, and I want to spend a few minutes discussing that. Now, I, I want to say at the outset that the coronavirus crisis for the European Union is a tremendous shock, bigger than for other parts of the world, and actually it might prove um, a big push towards um, historic disarticulation of it. I won't talk about collapse of it because I don't think it will collapse, but historic disarticulation uh, of the European Union. The thing to say about the European Union is that it has been drifting since about 2013. I presented you with a general picture of uh, financial capitalism drifting the last decade. Well, the European Union as a political organization has been drifting square. I mean, I, I, it is, it's the definition of drifting. It, it's just, it's, it's failed to take any serious decisions about which way it's gonna go. And politically, uh, it's been one day at a time. No direction, no strategy that I can see. What the crisis has done, <clears throat> and it's done it very rapidly, is to catapult the nation state into prominence. Everything I said previously about the side of the supply, the side of the demand and how to respond, pivoted on the state, as I said, and on local communities. Well, that's what's happened in the European Union. We haven't had a communal response and the absence of it is not accidental. I wanna come back to it. What we've had is in practice, each nation state taking action to defend its economy and its society as best it can. And the institutions and mechanisms of the European Union so far have actually proven uh, as much of a hindrance as a help, probably more, more of a hindrance than a help to nation states in dealing with the coronavirus um, crisis. Um, in particular, the euro has emerged once again as a major problem for the European Union. And the tensions between core and periphery um, have become once again um, very, very sharp and very strong. Um, I think we can cut across much of the, um, uh, of the detail by looking directly at what they've actually done so far, uh, what they, the union has done as a whole and putting it in, in the context of the previous discussion. So what have they done? They've done some important things. Um, not positively to deal with the crisis, but to allow nation states to, to deal with the crisis, not to, not to hinder nation states. So what have they done? Well, they lifted the Stability and Growth Pact. The European Union operated until a few weeks ago under the Stability and Growth Pact, which is, which is a polite name for austerity. This is the, the logic of it was austerity, fiscal austerity, tightness, and so on, for working people mostly, they've lifted that. So, member states can now operate without paying too much attention for the moment to the need for surpluses and so on. In other words, austerity is taking a backseat. They had to do that because obviously otherwise the state, nation states would have been unable to intervene. So that's the first thing they've done. Uh, the second thing they did, which is also very important, is they have relaxed state aid rules. The European Union uh, has, for the last two decades, operated under very tight state aid rules in the name of uh, competition, right? equalizing competition. So states um, have been unable to intervene to uh, rebalance their economies in the direction of industry and so on, because they've been prevented from doing it um, through the European Court of Justice as well in the final instance. That has been one main um, one of the main levers of neoliberalism in Europe. Well, that's also been lifted. So stability and growth pact has been lifted for now. State aid rules have been relaxed for now. Um, the, third thing, the third thing they have done um, relates to the European uh, Central Bank, the ECB. Now, the European Central Bank was reluctant to intervene to start with, 
And that's because, of course, as I've already mentioned, the European Union does not respond positively as a totality. It cannot do that. Right? It, does, it, 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 doesn't, it, it, it is loath to do that. However, the European Central Bank was forced to respond in the end because the more it was, re the more it was delaying uh, a response as a central bank, the more the financial markets of the Union um, were, were, were heading towards a major crisis and German and French banks were threatened with collapse. So eventually, the European Central Bank had to respond and had to adopt a program um, similar to what the Federal Reserve is doing in the United States, but not as big, not remotely as big. Uh, it adopted a program uh, through which it basically buys uh, state bonds. It can go into the secondary market and, and buy state bonds. These are the three crucial things that they've done so far. However, when you look at positive responses again, you're not gonna find any. There will be no euro, no euro bonds or corona bonds, as they call them. That is basically being killed off. And that, that was killed off at the last Eurogroup meeting last week. And today they're meeting again. The leaders are meeting again in a similar fashion to us. That's how they're gonna be meeting um, to discuss whether they're going to organize some kind of joint fiscal response. Uh, in other words, putting some money together and helping um, the southern weaker states, peripheral states, uh, deal with the crisis. Don't hold your breath. Don't expect any serious, um, any serious uh, funding to um, be made available to Spain or to Italy or to Portugal or to Greece and so on. Something will probably be done, something, um, but don't hold your breath for any big amounts of money because, of course, the core of the union, the leading countries of the union, the, the hegemonic powers of, of, of the union, Germany, and then other countries in the north, Holland and so on, do not want to uh, make uh, taxpayers' money available to the south. This isn't, this isn't um, an alliance of partners. This is an alliance of nation states. And nation states in the north do not wish to uh, share risks and to pay for activity um, um, and, and, and policies uh, in the South. Now, that's where we are. Now think about it for a minute. What have we got politically? Where are we politically? While this has been happening, there's been a tremendous hue and cry in Europe, partly reproduced in the UK among the, um, the remnants of the Remain camp, who still cannot believe that Britain is out. Um, so uh, there's been a tremendous hue and cry to the effect that Europe must now take the next step and issue euro bonds, corona bonds, uh, borrow jointly because that's gonna solve our problems. Think about it for a minute. Let's assume that this happens. Let's assume that they actually go for corona bonds, which they will not do, but let's assume they do th that they do it. Or let's assume that the European Central Bank buys even more bonds than it is buying at the moment. It decides that, okay, we're not going to have euro bonds, but I'm going to buy any bonds that governments publish, uh, issue. I will come out and buy all the bonds. Let's assume that this is what happens. What would that mean for the European Union and for the Eurozone in particular? There is no stability and growth pact. There are no state regu aid regulations. And then the European Central Bank will be buying bonds um, across, the, across the Union. In other words, we've got a system here in which there is, there is no coherence. There, is, there are no rules. There are nation states that spend what they need, help their industries as they need. And then there is this printing press in Frankfurt, which will produce the money, which will allow states to get on with it. Where is the union in this? What kind of union is that? Where, where is the logic? Where is the, the coherence? Where is the convergence? Where are the common policies? Uh, in other words, the Europhiles, who are now arguing strongly uh, that the union must go further and further down this uh, line, do not quite appreciate that what's happening is that the union is falling apart in front of our own eyes. And the more you push for that, the more you argue for the disintegration of it. Effectively, the European Union has become an empty shell. It's an empty shell financed by the European Central Bank. What does this mean for us? 
of a socialist. I think it means that um, we set aside all that ideological stuff about Europe and what it will do. Thankfully in Britain, this is now in retreat. We set that aside and we argue that what we need to confront the crisis and what we need to confront the inability of capitalism today to deal with crises like that uh, in any meaningful way, what we need is um, democratic state intervention on the basis of popular will and the basis of popular participation and on the basis of communal uh, organization from below. If we're going to restructure the economy, if we're going to borrow to do it, we need to have a say on how the money is borrowed, how the money is repaid, and what happens in the sphere of supply. Who creates wealth, how it is created, what kind of goods we, we wish to see, how do we wish to trade, what kind of international links do we want, and what kind of local uh, activities do we want to promote, and how to use state aid in order to do that. All that is also fundamental if you really wish to have any kind of policy that will do things about the environment, that will confront the needs of the um, uh, working people in the poorer areas, uh, and so on. I think it's pretty clear. I think that's where we are. Um, and I think we need to start thinking more along those lines and sharpening the policies and sharpening our demands. That's all I've got to say. I've spoken for too long. Um, and I look forward to the discussion.